Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to this second uh, online only debate of the Easter term at the Cambridge Union. Wherever you are, I hope you're safe and I hope you're doing well. I'm Adam Davies, president of the union, and the motion before the house this evening is this house regrets online pornography. It's a very timely debate given everything that's going on. If you're a member of the union, you can vote to decide, kind of share your thoughts on what you think of this motion before the debate at cus.org slash elections. So make sure if you're a member of the union to vote beforehand so you can figure out how the debate sway people. The way it's gonna work is that each speaker is gonna give an eight to 10 minute speech for their side. We're gonna alternate as usual. But if you're familiar with our in-person events, we're not gonna be able to do floor speeches or points of information, so don't try. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. It's Haley McNamara. She's director of the International Center on Sexual Exploitation, and she will be speaking in proposition the motion. Haley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. And I agree, I'd like to start by saying, I hope all of watching and participating in the debate are healthy and well during this time. Hardcore internet pornography, which is limitless in volume and extremity, is an entirely new variable in human evolution. Never before in human history have our ancestors had instant, anonymous, and limitless access to high-speed pornography, let alone have previous generations been raised with this content, acting as their sexual education from a young age, often before a first kiss. While some believe porn is a healthy sexual outlet, this couldn't be further from the truth. Reams of research show that pornography is linked to neurological harm, erectile dysfunction, unhappy or coercive relationships, and even offline sexual violence. Let's start, start first with the brain. Since 2009, there have been over 40 neurological studies that support the reality of compulsive porn use and the negative impacts of porn on the user's brain structures and functions. Among these many studies, 2014 MRI research found that increased porn use is linked to decreased brain matter in the regions of the brain associated with motivation and decision-making. This shrinkage was more pronounced in the heaviest users. Now, this might be shocking to some of us because scientists used to believe that once you finish childhood, your brain lost the ability to grow. But now we know that the brain goes on changing throughout life. It's a term called neuroplasticity, constantly rewiring itself, laying down new nerve connections, especially in youth, but also in adults. And when we learn, new neural, neuronal pathways are created. Think of a neuronal pathway like a trail in the woods. Every time someone uses a trail, it gets a little wider and a little more permanent. Similarly, every time a message travels down a neuronal pathway, the pathway gets stronger. And those that don't get used enough will likely be replaced, or in our analogy, they'll be covered over by nature. It's use it or lose it. Porn has a powerful impact on forming these new, long-lasting pathways in our brain. Like other addictive substances and behaviors, porn activates the part of the brain called the reward center. This triggers a release of a cocktail of chemicals that give you a buzz. One of the chemicals in that cocktail is a protein called delta Fos B. delta Fos B is like a bulldozer for creating the neuronal pathways in the woods of your brain. And so it primes the brain really to make strong mental connections between the porn being consumed and the pleasure that it creates. Basically, delta Fos B says, this feels good, let's do it again. So delta Fos B is important for learning any kind of new skills, but it can also lead to addictive and compulsive behaviors, especially in adolescence. This is why it's not surprising that research shows compulsive porn users' brains actually light up in the pleasure centers just like a cocaine addict's when shown activity-specific cues. This is a hallmark of addiction or compulsive use. For some users, though of course not all, this neurological chemical activity leads to a desensitization, which means that the porn they started watching doesn't arouse them the same way over time. That desensitization then leads to escalation, as we see with alcoholics or drug users who need more quantity or higher doses to replicate the old high. Similarly, some porn users begin to use more porn over time or begin to view more shocking or degrading content. This need to escalate can also lead to offline sexually coercive or violent actions. Sometimes porn users find themselves even shocked at the kind of content that they're watching now compared to when they first started watching. 
pornography. The neurological impact of porn impacts many offline realities in the lives of users and their partners. Research shows that pornography use is linked to negative body image in both men and women, along with increased pressure and coercion in sexual relationships to perform the acts that are being seen in pornography. People want to copy it and they'll coerce their partners in some instances to do so. Several studies of young men even found that porn was linked to lower sexual satisfaction with the partner and lower erectile function. This happens because the chemical cues for arousal in the brain sometimes become wired to the pixels on the screen instead of a real sexual partner in some heavy pornography users. Those neuronal pathways in the forest of porn become larger and more appealing than the pathway for partnered sex. There are a few things more sex negative, we can agree, than a substance that decreases the ability to have real sex in some people. Pornography also shapes the user's sexual templates around themes of degradation, unclear consent, and violence. A 2018 study found a significant trend of eroticized violence against women in most online pornography. Females of all ages in this study were more likely to display pleasure in videos where they endured violence than in videos where they did not. And while some tout the concept of quote unquote feminist pornography that shows consent, relationship, and female pleasure, the reality is that because of the neurological need for escalation that we discussed earlier, few if any will stick around to watch vanilla porn for long. Soon they'll escalate to the more extreme material that the mainstream industry happily provides. Porn is teaching that violence against women is sexy. Playboy magazine, as we all know, is obsolete. The typical internet porn revolves around themes of rape, racist sexual stereotypes, and incest themes. The messages porn sends are being heard loud and clear. A meta-analysis reviewing 46 different studies reported that the effects of porn use are quote unquote clear and consistent and put one at increased risk for committing sexual offenses and accepting rape myths, such as that women enjoy rape. Even the American CDC has acknowledged that pornography can be connected to public health issues like sexual violence. Further, we really need to remember that many viewers of this content are children. Research shows that early exposure to porn has been linked to increased likelihood of child-on-child -child harmful sexual behavior, including a study that found children are more than six times more likely to exhibit sexually aggressive behavior towards other children if they've watched violent pornography. And child-on-child -child harmful sexual behavior is a growing problem around the world as families are struggling to report or speak out for fear of ruining the offending child's life. For example, I recently heard of an 11-year-old boy who regularly watched pornography and then sexually abused a four-year-old neighbor while making his younger siblings watch as if it were a pornographic film. Dr. Marianne Layden, psychotherapist at the University of Pennsylvania, states that there are two paths children take to sexually harming another child. One is prior sexual abuse that they experienced, and the other path is hardcore pornography exposure. The young boy in this recent case had, and many others, have never been sexually abused, but he did watch, regularly watch porn. Unfortunately, it's virtually impossible to prevent children from being exposed to porn. It's a business making billions of dollars a year. It's not a free speech crusade. It knows that the younger it can get someone hooked on the product, the more likely they'll have a customer for life. Further, while this research is incredibly important, it's also relevant to shed light on the real life trauma that's being uploaded and monetized by mainstream pornography websites. Pornhub is the largest porn site and so presumably the most safe and secure. It's certainly the most mainstream. Yet even this website has been caught hosting sex trafficking videos of more than 20 women. The women have even won court cases against the porn producer traffickers Yet Pornhub still hosts and profits from their videos to this day. Pornhub has also been caught in recent months hosting videos of 15 year old girls being raped, of non consensually shared nude images of minors, and more. This is because the porn industry is, as a whole, inherently incapable of sufficiently judging consent in its videos. And even the most mainstream porn site in the world fails to require meaningful consent or even age verification to upload videos. There's a worldwide movement that's waking up to the research and the reality of the harms of pornography. In America, 15 states have declared pornography a public health hazard. Canadian members of parliament have spoken out. 
multiple countries besides the UK are analyzing ways to either employ age verification measures or even to stop distribution altogether. A petition to shut down Pornhub is nearing a million signatures, and I've personally been speaking with advocates in Sweden, Liberia, the Ukraine, Uganda, Cambodia, and more in just the past few weeks about how they are seeing pornography intersecting with and fueling various forms of sexual exploitation in their countries. So given the new nature of pornography in the human ecosystem and the mounting evidence of its harms to the brain, relationships, erectile function, sexual violence and exploitation, it is vital to critically analyze it and to forge multiply, multidisciplinary responses to address it. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Thank you very much for that speech. The next speaker will be from the opposition. It will be Epiphany Jones. Epiphany Jones is a content creator and webcam performer. Epiphany. Hey everyone, um, thank you for having us here. Everyone's staying safe and well. Um, I've been in industry now for a number of years. Um, I first came into the industry after being made redundant from my job. Um, I had intentions of going back into a corporation job but um, I wasn't able to find a, a job that would fit my needs. As a single mother, um, I needed that work and home life balance. Um, also, I was tired of being exploited by corporations, long hours, um, high stress, high pressure, and affected wages. Um, I felt like being self-employed was better for me. So um, after talking to some friends, um, all of which were gamers that are very successful and strippers, I um, decided that, that being an online content creator was the best solution for me. I couldn't work at a strip club um, as I have a, a, a daughter at home. Um, when I found out about online sites, um, that seemed to fit my lifestyle perfectly. I could work whenever I wanted to and earn money. Um, I did a lot of research into all of the sites before I joined. Um, and one thing that surprised me was each, every site that I researched has a legal framework in place, be that um, terms and conditions um, of the site. Um, it strictly outlines um, rules and regulations for both uploaders um, as well as the users. Now, the rules very much mirror um, what we have in society. Everything that is morally wrong and illegal in this world is banned on the sites that I work on. Um, the sites um, are serious about that and they, they take their terms and conditions seriously. They implement safeguarding measures where keywords like um, child porn or um, rape, things like that are banned from the site. You can't write them in your descriptions of videos and you can't search for them types of videos. Um, they're very strict with very I've been through the verification process two days. Um, I had to use my passport and my home ID as well as prove my home address. Um, I agree that verification could be stricter. Um, we, you know, we, we want to make sure the sites want to make sure that they're doing everything in their power to stop any horrendous crimes from happening, fraud and, and things like that. Um, so the sites are always looking at ways to um, to, to do the best possible way of verifying site, of verifying users. And as an online technology company, they're always using technology to their advantage. For example, um, the UK currently have um, an IDVT, which is an identity document validation technology, which um, verifies any ID that's uploaded to a site, not only porn, but also gambling sites, anywhere any age verification. Um, this technology um, makes sure that the, that the uh, passport is legit um, by um, exchanging information with, um, with the government as well as um, other agencies to make sure that that um, passport hasn't been stolen. It brings up any alerts for any sex traffic or sex crimes also. Um, I, I was concerned when I heard that there was an online um, movement for eradicating porn because um, people like me and there's 73,000 UK sex workers, consenting sex workers in the UK at the moment, people like me would be forced to go onto the streets or onto the dark web. 
I would be at the mercy of pimps, at the mercy of gangs. It would also be put in society at greater risk of exposing them to these. Um, um, if we look back at 1995, um, there was a massive boom of, um, of, of violent offences and sexual crimes. Um, and if you look at the research from the Office of National Statistics on violent crimes and sexual offences, since um, the online boom of pornography, recent statistics have shown that since March 2006, only 1.3 million offences have been um, reported. Now that, that number is still high. And as a consenting sex worker, I believe that we can work together and bring that uh, down even more. Eradicating online pornography will put us consenting sex workers at a greater risk. You move away from the safeguarding of the site, the terms and conditions, the verifications, um, it, it puts us in more danger. I know people who buy my content are verified um, they are of age, whereas if I'm on the street, I don't have that safeguarding. I don't have the support there who I can report these things to. I'm on my own and I'm at the mercy of things. Um, so I'd like to think that we can all work together because we all have the same agenda. We, I want to produce ethical porn. Nobody wants to put their business in jeopardy. The sites don't want to lose out on money. We don't want to harm or damage anyone. We don't want to morally corrupt or deprave the um, society. We just want to entertain and entertain adults and have fun. And um, from my experience, it's very fun. I. I know that there is um, a downside to the industry, but the industry have things in place like pineapple support. Um, I, me and my friends have had a great experience in, in, in online porn. I'm now a business owner. I'm a registered business. I've got a pension. I own my own house. I, I wouldn't have been able to do all of that if it hadn't have been for these online sites. And as much as they, there is a, there is things that we need to put in place to further protect people. I, I, I agree with that, but eradicating online porn isn't the way to do it. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your experience and for that wonderful speech. The next speaker will be from the proposition. It's Jo Bartosz. She's a journalist and director of the campaign group Critical Sisters. Jo, the floor is yours. Lovely, thank you. So I'm gonna open this with a confession. And it's a bit of an embarrassing one, given that my family will probably be watching this. And that's that I'm a bit of a wanker. Now, that might be evident to my critics, but I think it needs pointing out because those of us who are uh, opposed to pornography are often portrayed as being against pleasure. But actually, unlike pornographers, I want you all to masturbate without shame, to have enjoyable sex, and to have imaginations that are full enough not to need to be fed by other people's monetized fantasies. And there is a powerful truth that underscores this debate, and that is that pornographers do not care about your sex life. The only thing pornographers care about is making money, and they make a lot of it. Estimates suggest the pornography industry generates between 15 billion and 97 billion a year. For context, Hollywood as a whole is valued at around 11 billion. So from record rates of erectile dysfunction to the inability to connect to sexual partners, men have many good reasons to regret online pornography. So as a feminist campaigner, what I care about is the impact on women and girls. In 2010, researchers analysed 300 popular porn scenes and found 88% contained physical aggression, overwhelmingly committed by men against women. And last year, a large survey of British men under 40 revealed that 71% have spat at, gagged, slapped or strangled their female partner during sex. A third admitted to not asking for consent beforehand over half acknowledged that pornography had influenced their interest in violent sex. And one respondent, who I'll refer to as Dick, 
not his real name, told the BBC, uh, who commissioned the survey, that he had tried part choking and slapping his partner during sex, but that it never turns out the way it looks in porn. When you try it in real life, you're disappointed quite a lot. I imagine his partner was probably a little underwhelmed too. But it is not just adult women who are bearing the brunt of online pornography. Over 40% of girls in the UK between the ages of 13 and 17 say they have been coerced into unwanted sex acts. So in other words, they're victims of rape and sexual assault. In any other context, the driver for such criminal abuse would be interrogated, but somehow we all become oddly coy when it comes to criticizing behavior that happens in the bedroom. It's as if the veneer of sex deflects critical thought. But it should be remembered that once upon a time, we were quick to dismiss domestic abuse as a private matter that happened behind closed doors. And as I deliver this speech, I wonder how many women watching today will have been hit, spat at, strangled, or coerced into unwanted painful sex acts because of their partner's porn use. And I know that it's an uncomfortable truth that many will not even have the framework to recognize this as abusive because they have been groomed by pornography to think of it as normal. And the consequences can be extreme. Earlier this year, I spoke to a young woman called Rose. In 2009, when she was 14, Rose was abducted at knife point and held for 12 hours, during which time she was raped, beaten and stabbed in the leg by two men while a third filmed parts of the assault. A few months later, Rose was browsing social media when she found herself tagged by others at her school in footage of the attack in films including teen crying and getting slapped around, teen getting destroyed, passed out teen. One of them had over 400,000 views. So she recalls that the worst videos were the ones where I was passed out. So I invite the audience to consider is her experience not enough to make you reconsider whether online pornography is to be regretted? And teen is one of the most popular search terms on Pornhub. It has been since the platform was started. And in the teen category, you will find titles like barely legal Thai street teen fucked and facialized for $5. That film currently has 3 million views. Other popular categories include incest, and at the time of writing, the most popular film on Pornhub is Stepson Fucked His Young Stepmother. And as an aside, I'm sure I don't need to point out to a Cambridge audience the passive object in that title. And independent pornographers who brand themselves as alternative are no better. So one of my opponents in this debate has worked with a producer of so-called lesbian films with titles including I Wanna Bang My Sister and My First Black Girlfriend. Another top performing genre is panal, and that's a charming portmanteau of pain and anal. And preparing for this talk today, within 30 seconds, I found a film called Unprepared Raw Anal Milf Can't Handle the Pain, But He Kept Going. It currently has 4 million views. If further proof were needed that pornography is about male supremacy and not about sex, I'll uh, let you listen to the words of CEO Paul Heskey. He helpfully explains. Essentially, it comes from every man who looks at his wife who's just nagged him. And he says, I'd like to fuck you in the ass. He's angry at her, right? And he can't. So he would rather watch some girl taking it. Because when people watch anal, nobody wants to watch a girl enjoying anal. Mm, empowering. So those who are the smiling face of the industry, the women who claim to love doing porn and take part in debates like this, are not representative. When you look into the histories of most women in pornography, a familiar pattern emerges. Where childhood trauma and sexual abuse is replayed in every scene, with bodies numbed by drugs and self-loathing. Indeed, the world's most famous pornographer, Jenna Jameson, disclosed that she was raped as a child, and then again by her abusive boyfriend's uncle, and then again by a group of high school boys who severely beat her and then left her for dead. Her story is far from unusual. So I invite you after this debate to look up the stories of women in pornography and join up the dots. Because it's not just those in the Anglosphere who are exploited. On a global scale, it is estimated that 4.8 million people worldwide are trafficked into forced sexual exploitation. 21% of those are children, 96% are female. 
Indeed, those who have fled war and famine and disaster are themselves the subject of refugee porn. And the fact that so little action is taken by international bodies, the fact that there aren't COVID meetings every day to deal with the scale of this emergency reveals the industry as both one of the most powerful in the world and arguably just how many of our politicians are quite literal misogynist tossers. And those who consume pornography whilst wringing their hands about fair trade coffee and single use plastics are hypocrites. The average shelf life of a female performer in pornography in the USA is around three years. And some estimates suggest that by my age, 37, she will be dead. Were I to use racial slurs in this debate, I would rightly be called out. And yet when it comes to pornography, dehumanizing racist stereotypes are positively encouraged, with black men portrayed as sexually aggressive and bestial, Asian women as submissive and exotic, Eastern European women as impoverished and desperate to please. People in pornography are afforded no humanity. And like all addictions, pornography users become desensitized, seeking out more and more depraved and extreme content. Now this suits pornographers who use algorithms to warp desire further, securing new markets for ever more niche content. But the impact of this is not just in the violence that adult women are subjected to, but in a huge growth in the production and distribution of images of child sexual abuse. Figures since the online shift show this starkly. In the UK, the number of images on the police's child abuse database has risen dramatically from fewer than 10,000 in the 1990s to 13.4 million currently. And as the UK entered lockdown, Simon Bailey, the national chief uh, police lead for child protection, outlined a growing trend. British men aged between 18 and 26 are emerging as a new group of online paedophiles. He explains, they get to the point where there's no pornographic material that's stimulating them. So then they start to explore what child abuse imagery might look like. They start getting their kicks from that. It is a conceit of the highest order to pretend that pornography is anything other than the privileged orgasming over the exploitation of the world's most vulnerable and desperate people, and it hurts everyone. The so-called willing performers who suffer from double incontinence, drug abuse, PTSD, and premature death. The forced 4.8 million people trafficked into the industry. The pornography consumers themselves, who are so numbed to pleasure they are unable to enjoy fulfilling relationships. Each of these groups has every reason to regret online pornography. So I urge those opposing the motion, those who think that pornography is sexually liberating, to look into the eyes of performers, those who are referred to as cum holes, as sluts, as bitches, and ask yourselves, is your orgasm worth it? Thank you. No, thank you, Joe, for that wonderful speech. The next speaker will be from the uh, opposition, obviously. It will be Jerry Barnett. Jerry is, a jur uh, Jerry, sorry, Jerry is a journalist. He's an author of Porn Panic. He's a political activist and a technologist. Jerry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Jerry Barnett. My Twitter ID is at Porn Panic, and I'm also the author of a, a book called Porn Panic. I first became involved with the online porn industry in the mid 90s when I was running a software company, and I launched my own adult movie site in 2004, which I eventually closed in 2013. I've been involved in some form of political activism for about 40 years, and I became interested in the politics of porn, sexual freedom and censorship over a decade ago. I've done a number of debates like this and my last time at the Cambridge Union was almost five years ago. This is my first debate in lockdown, so I'm going to apologize if my children burst in behind me and I have to start pretending I'm talking about Peppa Pig. Um, but tonight's debate is titled, This House Regrets Online Pornography. <clears throat> and um, obviously I, I don't regret online pornography and I see no good reason why you should or, any, or anybody should either. When you listen to anti-porn arguments, they tend to fall into two broad categories. They argue that there are negative effects on the, um, on the performers or that there are negative effects on the viewers. I'm going to argue the converse. Pornography is broadly beneficial to society and to its users. I would never argue that online porn has no effect on society. It clearly has a profound effect. Um, and those of us old enough to remember the rise of online pornography 
will, um, in the 1990s, will remember how much it changed the world in big and small ways. For example, for many gay and transgender people in conservative communities that often provided their first access to other people like themselves, it brought sex out of sleazy dark corners and it made it public for the first time in human history. It taught us that sex isn't dirty or shameful. It taught us that everybody is different and that sexual feelings are not to be ashamed of. In this debate, you'll hear claims that porn is harmful in various ways. These claims will probably be backed by anecdotes, terrible stories about terrible things that happen to nameless people. I'd ask the audience to listen critically and to remember that a claim without evidence has little value. Since porn is often presented as a women's rights issue by radical feminists, I'll also remind you that there are male as well as female performers, that there are transgender and queer performers, and that porn is widely consumed and enjoyed by women as well as men. In fact, contrary to the stereotypes, women often have freakier sexual tastes than men, and that's reflected in porn viewing. This debate really begins in 1969 at the height of the sexual revolution, when porn took its first leap into the mainstream. Two key things happened that year. Firstly, Denmark became the first country to scrap its anti-porn laws, its obscenity laws, which meant that porn became legal there overnight, and that became the first place in the world where porn was legal. Um, and at the same time in the United States, the Supreme Court ruled that pornography constituted speech in the context of the First Amendment, which meant that it was constitutionally protected from state censorship. These decisions infuriated religious groups as well as some feminist groups and laid the way for porn wars that have been raging ever since. For the past 50 years, the Republicans in America, the religious right and anti-porn feminists have been fighting to, to label porn as dangerous and trying to persuade governments to suppress it. In response to the Supreme Court's decision, the American president at the time set up the world's first inquiry into whether viewing porn could be linked to harm. When the report was published in 1970, it was recommended that further research needed to be done, but stated that it could not find any evidence that porn was harmful to the people who viewed it. Half a century later, and there's been an immense amount of research done, and the conclusion remains broadly the same. Despite the fact that motivated activists have been desperate to label porn as harmful, they simply don't have the evidence to back their case. The uptake of porn was driven by technology. It was the invention of video and then DVD and then the internet that broke porn out of cinemas in red light districts and brought it safely and anonymously to the masses. So for half a century, porn has been widely available and over that time it has become increasingly cheap and easy to access. What that means is that hundreds of millions, if not billions of people have watched porn over the past few decades. Hundreds of thousands of people have worked in the industry. So we have a lot of data. Anti-porn advocates will try to claim that somehow this is a new phenomenon or that not enough research has been done. Um, in fact, a vast amount of research has been done and far more is ongoing. As well as research, we have tons of statistical data. We can look at the effect on entire nations as porn has become available and see the outcomes in terms of crime and public behavior. I devoted a chapter of my book, Porn Panic, to examining this data. We know, for example, that, that in the United States between the late 1970s and the mid 2000s, the prevalence of sexual vi violence fell by 85%. Now it would be too simplistic to simply claim that this is due to pornography. There were many social changes taking, taking place during that era. But remember, the anti-porn movement claims that porn makes men less empathetic and more dangerous towards women. And if all this hate and objectification was being stoked up by porn over all these years, we'd expect to see this reflected in crime figures, but it isn't. A researcher called Todd D. Kendall looked deeper into the American statistics and found that US states with faster internet adoption in the 1990s saw steeper declines in sexual violence while states that were slower to adopt the internet saw slower declines or none at all. He found that internet access was strongly linked with a decline in, in, in sexual violence perpetrated by young men, particularly in the 15 to 19 age group. These statistics have been repeated in other countries. Similar trends were seen in <clears throat> Scandinavia and West Germany after they legalized pornography. When communism fell in Czechoslovakia in 1989 and censorship was abolished, the country saw a steep rise in porn usage and a rapid significant fall in both rape and child abuse. 
you won't hear the anti-porn people discuss these statistics. Instead, you hear a lot of words designed to cause, to create a sense of fear. Objectification, sexualization, pornification, porn addiction. They quote neurological pseudoscience that claims porn has the same effects on the brain as cocaine. Or they make unproven claims that porn might lead to erectile dysfunction, claims that are obviously designed to scare young men. You hear sex workers and porn performers degraded and dehumanized by the very people who claim to want to rescue them. They refer to them as prostituted, prostituted women, or they use similar words designed to suggest that no woman in her right mind could actually want to have sex for a living. The anti-prostitution movement isn't new. There have always been people claiming to want to rescue sex workers, strippers, and porn stars from the evil clutches of the sex industry. But notably, they never ask sex workers what they actually, whether they actually want to be rescued. The old Christian conservative groups have relabeled themselves, adopting language that sounds feminist and claiming that they simply want to end the exploitation of women and children. And who couldn't want to do that? But Haley McNamara's group, now known as the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, is a right wing Christian group formerly known as Morality and Media. When Donald Trump passed the Foster Law in America a couple of years ago, which closed down websites where escorts advertised, as well as hookup sites, Haley tweeted in triumph. But preventing escorts from advertising didn't rescue them from sex work. It simply made them less safe, led to an increase in street prostitution, and led directly to an increase in the murders of sex workers. The rescue industry is a morality movement, not a women's rights movement. I call on this house to reject the motion. There's no good reason to regret online pornography, but plenty to celebrate. Thank you very much, Jerry, for that speech. The next speaker will be from the proposition. It's Raquel Rosario Sanchez, who is a spokesperson for the UK-based feminist group Philia. Raquel? Well, thank you. Thank you very much to the Cambridge Union for extending this invitation to Philia. Thank you very much to the organizers of this event for putting it together during such a, um, a challenging time and particularly for having the audacity to tackle such an important issue head on. Before we begin, I would like to say thank you also very much to all of the speakers on both sides, <coughs> sorry, on both sides of this debate. I look forward to an intense and respectful debate within the paramount importance of free speech and intellectual exploration. As the Cambridge Union Society rightfully states, um, the global lockdown enacted as a response to the COVID-19 health crisis has seen an increase in the consumption of online pornography. As such, it raises a number of issues which must be addressed from a variety of angles. At Philia, our position is unapologetic about this matter. And our position is that online pornography is a form of male violence against women and girls. As a women's rights charity, Philia is committed to building sisterhood and solidarity locally, nationally, nationally, and globally, to amplifying the voices of women, particularly those less often heard and purposefully silent, and to defending women's human rights. And defending women's human rights includes fighting for the abolition of the sex industry, which of course includes the porn industry. I appreciate the speeches given by my fellow speakers, but before we begin, there is one thing um, that I want to be absolutely clear about, and that is that and that is that from a feminist point of view, the problem with online pornography is not sex and sexuality. The problem with online pornography is that it is a business model and therefore it is a market driven industry which depends on the exploitation of women's bodies, which is why we see these fears, which is why we see, which is, which is why we see this fierce competition between production com companies pushing for more extreme and violent content in order to stay fresh in what is a supply and demand transactional market. This is why in the porn industry, we see a revolving door of women, particularly very young women who don't last very much um, or very long because the requirements of, for novelty and the taxing demands of the industry on women's bodies are unsustainable in the long term. It is only by centering the profit-driven agenda, which is at the heart of the porn industry that we can have an honest conversation about it. It is a quite ingenious patriarchal trick to attempt to frame the conversation in terms of sex, morality, and free speech, but it is none of the less dishonest. The idea that the porn industry exists um, sort of like a philanthropic enterprise concerned mainly with providing an educational service uh, 
of teaching dim witted people how to have sex is far fetched. It is pretty clear, and there is strong scientific evidence of this, that human beings had already figured out how to have sex with each other before the advent of online pornography. I personally find it very amusing when I hear arguments have been anti porn or a porn abolitionist and rejecting the propositions of the sex trade equates to feminists be somehow anti-sex or fearful of sexuality, um, in part because I myself have a master's degree in sexuality studies. Um, so in this debate, we want to uh, underscore three main points. The first is that online pornography constitutes a form of violence against women. The second is that porn is about making a profit by exploiting the bodies of women, particularly very young women. And the third is that the mainstreaming of online pornography, along with its increased consumption, represents a decisive backlash to the gains of the women liberation movement. Um, we argue that online pornography constitutes a form of violence against women because of the effects of the industry on the status of women worldwide. We argue that the mainstreaming of online pornography represents a backlash against the women's liberation movement because the line between what happens within the industry and outside of it has become frightfully thin. And the backlash is decisively violent and misogyny. For example, we know that one of the most popular, popular genres within online pornography is the so-called rape porn, which eroticizes sexual assault and male violence against women. There have been a number of reports about how in a number of countries, but just put one example, India, um, men are recording themselves raping women and uploading those videos online so that other men can watch it. Um, in October 2016, Al Jazeera reported on the popularity of these videos, stating that in the northern state of Uttar, pa Uttar Pradesh, men can buy footage of a woman being raped for the price of a sheep meal. These videos go on to be watched countless times and have the effects of ensuring that that victim's trauma is preserved for posterity and shared exponentially. When Teen Vogue publishes an article in July 2017 about anal sex without ever mentioning the word woman, female, and includes an anatomic graphic, an anatomy graphic of the bodies of both sexes, which neglects to even point out the clitoris, then we know that something is at play and it is not a concern with women and girls' sexual pleasure. Although anal sex is a sexual preferences for many people, the feminist analysis compels us to consider that what we know from previous sexuality research, which is that the majority of women cannot achieve orgasm purely from vaginal penetrative sex. Even fewer can climax through anal sex um, because the majority of women who experience anal sex find it painful. Therefore, anal sex is particularly pressurable for men because men um, have a prostate. So a sexual health article aimed at teenage girls, which forgets to mention the most important female sex organ and encourages a type of sexual activity, which is generally painful for women and girls, is a byproduct of a porn culture which doesn't care about women's experiences and it doesn't care about women's pleasure. These are merely a couple of examples and we have not even begun to address the rise of upskirting, which has somehow uh, become very prevalent in countries that are now having to pass legislation in order to deter men from doing it, or the repugnant rise of rough sex defenses used in courts of law to justify male violence against women and femicide itself. I am worried that I may be running out of time, but before closing my remarks, I would like to just reiterate a point made by Professor Noam Shonsky, who was the previous speaker uh, hosted by the Cambridge Union Society this past Tuesday. Professor Shonsky has stated that pornography is the humiliation and the degradation of women, where women are degraded as vulgar sex objects and not like human beings. The fact that people agree to it and the fact that they get paid to it is about as convinced of the fact that we should be in favor of sweatshops and slavery. He has made the case that instead of attempting to improve the conditions within the porn industry, we should seek to abolish the porn industry. And that is our position at Telia. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel, for that wonderful speech. Uh, just one little note for me. I said that Jo was of Critical Sisters. She's actually now director of Click Off. That was my mistake, sorry. The final speaker for the opposition is Ella Darling. Ella Darling is a pornographic former and co-founder of the virtual reality company VR2.xxx. Ella, the floor is yours. 
Hi. Um, we are living in a time where there are many people who are quarantined and locked down in their homes. Uh, many people are at home alone without a romantic partner, without the ability to socialize or, or access a partner or romantic relationships. For these people, being able to find some form of sexual expression through pornography or social connection through cam performers or even uh, following their favorite performers only fans gives them a sense of connection to another person, even if it's transactional. And that is very important for mental health right now. As harrowing as this time is for the people in lockdown, there are many people for whom this is their daily norm, whether it's because of disability, uh, inability to socialize, lack of opportunity to engage romantically or socially because of their work. Those people deserve and need access to expression. I work for a company called Vero Play Space that creates virtual reality porn and is creating a social space on the internet for people to connect sexually and socially and romantically. We have a very warm community of people who've connected through pornography, who have supported each other and been given a space where they can explore their sexual identity, their sexual desires and their sexual orientation in a safe space. I have seen in front of my eyes people grow and free themselves of preconceived notions that they thought they had to follow socially because that's what they were told. Um, porn is something that the American Library Association does not block on computers, partially because if someone believes they might be homosexual, but it's unsafe for them to explore that on their own or talk to their family about it, this is a way for them to explore themselves in a safe way or to explore interests that they might not feel safe exploring in person or with their partner, but it gives them a space to do so. Um, the porn industry is seen as cutthroat by our, our opposition, but we actually are a very supportive industry that looks out for each other. I was the president of an organization called the Adult Performer Advocacy Committee, where we offered resources like accounting, tax guides, uh, financial planning, and safe medical professionals to other performers. We have something called the PASS system, which was created internally by our industry that allows us to verify um, the STI tests, which we get every two weeks of other people on set to make sure that we're safe and protected. Pineapple Support is an organization funded by porn companies that was created to offer free therapy to people in our industry from therapists who won't pathologize our work and our life choices. Pathologizing the attitudes and perspectives of people who enjoy sex differently leads to repression and harm. Um, in an assessment of the damaged goods hypothesis in the Journal of Sex Research, porn performers were actually found to have higher quality of life uh, in terms of energy, sleep, sexual satisfaction, positive feelings, body image, social support, spirituality, and financial security compared to the general population. Porn performers are not the victims of these big porn companies. We are participants, we create porn. Many porn performers are pornographers in their own right. They create their own content and they thrive on it. Um, we don't look to movies like The Fast and the Furious to teach us how to drive. We don't look to Tarantino films to teach us how to be functional members of nonviolent, racially accepting society. The Exorcist is not an entry point for Catholicism and Mad Max is not a guide through this dystopian time. It's entertainment, just like porn. We can watch fiction and understand that it's fiction and not a guide for life. So I don't see why we see porn as the exception to that. Porn does not purport itself to be sex education. In fact, porn is frequently blamed for children learning bad ideas about sex. But truly, that group is not our target audience at all. Um, if you don't believe that we ethically do not want to make porn for children, then consider financially, kids don't have credit cards. They're not consumers that we want or that we target. It's important that we take a proactive approach to teaching young people about sex and consent and porn literacy, but it should not be up to porn to teach young people any of those things. We're not the educators. Um, People say that porn uses women's bodies to turn a profit. So does construction work. So does retail where people are on their feet all day, but we're fine with these industries because they aren't aligned with sex. It's patronizing to imply that I don't have the agency to make decisions about my career as a porn performer. I've been in this industry for over 10 years. 
I have not been forced or coerced into doing sex acts that I don't choose to do. And there are things that I still have never done because they're just not of interest to me. We can oppose and regret pornography all the live long day if we want to, but the fact remains that it exists and that performers continue to come into this industry willingly and enthusiastically. And the rhetoric put forth by the opposition to porn is harmful for us. It, uh, it leads to the stigmatization against us. Um, it makes it so that if I decide that I just don't wanna perform anymore, I had a great time, but I'm ready for a new chapter of my life. Finding a new job can be nearly impossible. Porn performers are seen as damaged goods in other workforces. There's plenty of instances where performers have tried to transition to other work and were not able to do so because of this dangerous rhetoric. There's even an instance of a young man who was fired from Subway because he did a few gay porn scenes years ago. We're not even allowed to make sandwiches for people because we had the audacity to choose a career in porn. People have killed themselves because they feel trapped in the industry, not because the industry is bad, but because they're just not allowed to, to find a new path beyond it. Dichotomizing the whole industry as either good or bad lacks important nuance that is intellectually responsible. Um, sorry, that is intellectually irresponsible to disregard. I'm not allowed to have a bad day at work. I'm not allowed to criticize or, or express annoyance about anything on set because the moment I say anything against the industry, anything that could be taken out of context, my words are weaponized against me. I either have to be completely in support of every single thing in the porn industry, which I'm not, honestly, or, um, or I'm fueling anti-porn rhetoric. Um, I'd like to mention, I'd like to note some of the things that were brought up earlier. Um, Haley mentioned erectile dysfunction, but a 2015 study indicated that viewing sexual stimuli associated with greater sexual responsive, uh, responsiveness, not erectile dysfunction. Um, she also mentioned an 11 year old who watched porn regularly and committed heinous acts. I would ask why is an 11 year old in a situation where they're allowed to access porn regularly? That is a much more dire situation to me than the fact that porn exists. There's clearly some huge factors in the life of that child that certainly need to be examined. Um, as Terry pointed out, NCOSE, Haley's organization, was previously called Morality in the Media, um, an organization which has even classified Sports Illustrated as hardcore pornography. Um, industry resources like XBiz, uh, a journalist site, uh, they report accurately on the war on porn, but their reports, their articles are shadow banned on Google, while uh, organizations like Haley's are allowed to spread misinformation that is indexed and distributed widely. Um, Neil, uh, Neil Malamos at the University of California carried out numerous studies examining porn and sexual violence and concluded that men who are already sexually aggressive and consume sexually aggressive pornography uh, may be more likely to commit a sexually aggressive act, but he likened it to alcohol, something that isn't inherently dangerous, but for those who have high risk factors could exacerbate them. We don't campaign against alcohol, even though it's definitely addictive and harmful to minors, but because alcohol isn't associated with sex, we're not opposing it, we're not discussing that in this debate. Um, filmed crimes posted to the internet are not pornography, they're evidence. Um, there was a documentary called Bum Fights where someone uh, basically gave homeless people food or alcohol to be able to film them getting beaten up and they posted it online. Um, we don't use that as a reason why MMA and WWE should be uh, eradicated. There's no evidence beyond speculation that adults transition to pedophilia because they watch porn. That quote actually came from a police officer who went on record saying that religion needs to play a stronger role in law enforcement. This is religiously driven. Sex workers and porn performers are a population of people who choose their work because it's what's right for them and it fits their lifestyle. That's why I chose it. That's why Epiphany chose it. That's why all of the people that I know in pornography chose this industry because it's what works for them. Thank you very much. 
but sorry. Thank you very much for that speech. And thank you to all of our speakers for their wonderful speeches. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. So just a few announcements from me. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube page uh, to get more updates. Please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We have a panel on the European project tomorrow night at 6 p.m. We have a panel of BME leaders at 3 p.m. on Saturday. And we have a panel on education and coronavirus at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. If you're a member of the union and would like to share your views on this debate, go to cus.org slash elections and cast your ballot. And we also separately had a by-election for some officers of the union today. And I'm happy to announce that Georgia Gray has been, out, has been elected as diversity officer for Michaelmas 2020, and Tara Bagat has been elected as social events officer for Michaelmas 2020. Thank you so much, everyone, again, and don't forget to vote. Thank you. Um, Adam? I'm just checking. Oh, you can leave. Oh, okay. All right. Nice to meet you all. Good to see you, Raquel. Bye. <laughs>